Hello, it's John Heaton, and today I'm going to get, do a review on the the ongoing feud between Roger Waters and uh, David Gilmour, uh, former members of Pink Floyd. And uh, I've been comparing it to other feuds. I reckon it might be the longest feud in music history. I mean, I haven't studied everyone, all the great partnerships over the years, but uh, it, this is following the latest instalment where Roger Waters did a short video and posted to his website uh, something along the lines of seeing as I'm banned from posting anything to the official Pink Floyd Facebook page with its nearly 30 million subscribers uh, I wanted to put out a statement on the new Animals reissue which is due to come out shortly some sleeve notes were written by a guy called Mark Page is it? I can't remember the name, sorry I had it written down um, Mark Blake, sorry, and uh, these got checked by the other members of Pink Floyd, by the members of Pink Floyd, and nobody had a problem with them in terms of their truth or veracity. But Gilmore said he didn't want them to go out because he wanted the history of Pink Floyd to be to remain a bit more enigmatic. And Roger des described the word as secret. <laughs> um, I don't know. It just seems so such a shame that after all these years they can't. They're still bickering at each other over things that happened 40 or 50 years ago. Um, and Roger Waters says that um, in slightly sarcastic tone, Dave Gilmore is and was a jolly good guitarist and sing singer. Uh, it doesn't mention his songwriting skills, by the way. Not that he wrote lyrics, but he did write some, some important tunes and some important musical elements of many Pink Floyd songs and that doesn't get mentioned um, but anyway Roger goes on to say that he's told some huge porky pies which means lies about the period when Roger was about his own contribution between 1968 and 1985 particularly re relating to the period when Roger said he was in charge well to, in many respects he was in charge because he came up with the concept of their last three albums and he wrote all the lyrics to the last three albums and in fact he wrote all the songs on the last album and virtually all of the songs on the wall um, and all of Animals apart from Dogs which takes up most of side one which is co-written but you know one could nitpick about whether he was the leader or whether he was because I think conceptually he, he was the leader in terms of coming up with the ideas for the albums, but then you look at his solo career and it hasn't really been half as impressive as it was, as his work was with the band. And one has to think that the contribution of David Gilmour on guitar and Rick Wright on keyboards, Nick Mason on drums, did, did a lot for, for Roger's songs and made them into a better work. And the fact that they were working as a group, they were particularly working as a group up until and including the wall I would say and then on the final cut they were not really working as a group at all and Dave Gilmore says um, and that's why there's only three good tracks on the album which I thought was a little bit ungenerous because there's more than three good tracks on the final cut um, maybe not more than six or seven but that, there's more than three that's for sure um, so I slightly resent Roger going up publicly slagging off Gilmore he's done it on and off for the last 35 years and uh, he tries to do it with a bit of humour and just talks about an, an, an instant when they made the tape loop for the cash register at the beginning of Money and Dave Gilmore in a 1982 interview is saying how that we did it this way and then we chose that and Roger says well unless he was hiding under the king chair he wasn't there in the room when I did that tape loop so well, on the other hand after 40 50 years people's memory do do vary and uh, we saw we've seen the same in the beatles with um you know various members of the beatles rec recalling the same occasion or the same happening with different recollections so i think that's just a a fact of the human mind um so when when or the human brain or as they get older it tends to invent things um, now when Pink Floyd first split up or when Roger left in 85 and then the others decided to carry on I was very much against that and 
Roger compares it to Paul McCartney and Ringo Starr going on the road as the Beatles. Well, it was a little stronger than that because they had three original members or two and Rick Wright was brought in to strengthen it. Um, but in all intents and purposes, it was a bit like the Beatles going out with John, without John Lennon or Paul McCartney and I don't think that would have been feasible or justifiable. And um, I can see why Gilmore did it and why the others did it because commercially Pink Floyd still had a was worth a lot of money and they toured on, on the back of that name for a good uh, another 10 years and made a, a shed load of money out of it and Nick Mason certainly did better by sticking with Dave than he would have done trying to go solo uh, or by sticking with Pink Floyd. Rick Wright the same. Um, there was a story but there was an argument when they were making the final cut and Dave Gilmore wanted a production credit and Roger wouldn't give it to him but he still Gilmore still insisted having a a percentage point off the top but basically you know one percent of the profits or the revenue would go to him in lieu of a production credit I guess or something like that and Nick Mason said to Roger I know you're right about this but I'm going to side with Roger with Gilmore because I know which side um, my bread is buttered basically anticipating that Roger was going to leave and Pink Floyd were, were going to carry on and Mason better be friendly with Gilmore otherwise he wouldn't have a living um, so that was quite honest, I suppose. Um, the post-Waters Floyd has always been a disappointment to me. I know my son Richie defends the division, the division bell, um, but I, and I, I think that's passable Floyd, but momentary lapse of reason is subpar for sure. Um, and d d Nick Mason's on record saying, he was asked why he thinks Roger and Dave are still at loggerheads. And he said, well, I think it's because Roger doesn't seem to respect Dave he seems to think writing is everything and playing the guitar and singing is well not as easy as anyone can do it but a lot easier than writing um, and he says he personally gets on with both of them and he finds it very disappointing that these two rather elderly men are still at loggerheads and um, I find it very disappointing as well I mean uh, um, I don't know what to say really. I'm, I was on Rogers in Rogers' camp, but I think I'm beginning to warm towards what what Gilmore might have to say about the whole thing. And I think he might have a point to keep Pink Floyd more enigmatic because when Animals came out, one of its charms was, you know, no pictures of any of the band members on the cover, just this mysterious Battersea Power Station with the flying pig, and these moody black and white pictures on the gatefold, and the lyrics which tell tell it all really. So one doesn't need detailed sleeve notes to find that record utterly compelling. And um, as the lyrics are sufficiently generic to make it timeless so that one can come back to it in a hundred years. And, and for example, a, a line like, hey, you White House, ha ha, charade you are. Although we know now that it was written about Mary Whitehouse at the time, there were probably listens in the US who were thinking it was aimed at the White House where the president lives. And I think that kind of enigmatic um, quality is, is quite valuable to have in a band. People can make what they want of the lyrics. And in the Ultimate Music Guide, the guy who writes the essay on animals says that he picked up the... He was on a school trip to London and he picked up the cassette of animals and that was his first listen to it. And he really didn't know what to make of it, but he was absolutely spellbound by it. And um, yeah... I think so, so that's that and then and let's just compare Waters and Gilmore's fallout and it's lasted for 35 years so far or more actually just slightly more compare that to other partnerships in history Gilbert and Sullivan um, who wrote the the Savoy operas fell out for four years after the gondoliers made up and then fell out for a further four years after the Grand Duke and then made up shortly before Sullivan's death so total of eight years being estranged. Lennon McCartney fell out for about three and three and a half years in the early 70s and then made up for the most part. Oasis Brothers, uh, it's been 12 years so far that they've been estranged but they're tw still 23 years short of Roger and Dave. Um, Mick Jagger and Keith Richards, even though the Stones are still together now, they did fall out for three or four years in the mid 80s. Um, the only one which approaches the same longevity in terms of fallout is Rick Davis and Roger Hodgson from Supertramp. But they, they, they don't bitch at each other in public or in their songs. And the only fallout they really had was they didn't, Roger didn't want Rick doing his songs in concert, which I can understand. 
Um, I think if Rick was quite entitled to go out under the Super Trump name, and the other one, after all, he did have Dougie and Bob and John, original band members. But I, I don't I think she would have. She should have stuck to Rick Davis numbers, and there are enough of those in the catalogue to sell out a crowd in the same way as when Roger does his concert. He does the songs which he sang lead vocal on and for the most part wrote. So even though in the case of Supertramp, a lot of songs are credited to Davis Hodgson. So I guess legally Rick Davis was able to do what he did. Um, but anyway, I, d I didn't agree with it. Um, so I'm hoping that they'll make up. Uh, they did make up once famously in 2008 for Live 8, uh, where they all four of them, including Rick Wright before he passed away, got together and did three songs. But that proved to be short-lived. They were still, shortly thereafter, they were back slagging each other off. Um, I think they do turn up at each other's concerts, or they have done on a couple of occasions. And on the Division Bell in 1994, there's a famous song where Gilmore is saying, I open my door to my enemies. I ask, can we, can we uh, wipe the slate clean? And you, you just tell me to go and fuck myself. Um, so that was, you know, Dave's take on his peace gesture to Roger, which got rejected. And there have been various attempts to reconcile, but they've, they've never succeeded. And I guess those two are going to gonna die as enemies, or, or not enemies, but uh, somewhat at loggerheads, which is a great pity, but what can you do? They wouldn't, they're not the first people in history to fall out, that's for sure, but just wish that they, they could reconcile, at least to some extent, even if they don't work together again. Thank you very much for watching. We'll see you next time.